the audience of Good Investing Talks, it's great to have you back. And now I've changed setup, as you see in this video. Normally, I'm sitting here doing the videos for you and the podcasts. But uh, today, I changed seats to welcome a special guest in my new home studio. It's Christopher Sai of Sai Capital. Hi, Cr Christopher. It's great to have you here. Tell me. It's amazing to be here in your new studio. Thanks for coming over. And um, I hope people like this format. Um, and uh, if they like it, please leave a comment and also subscribe to the channel if you haven't done. But now let's jump into the conversation. Christopher, you have built uh, Sci Capital for 23 years. And it's normally not like the usual thing to be in business 23 years as a fund manager. A lot of funds churn and uh, or leave the industry and go do something else or go broke or whatever. How did you survive for 23 years? We've had a consistent investment approach that has allowed us to outperform over time. I think that if you're not outperforming over time, you're not adding value to your clients. So there's no reason for you to survive. So that's the first, first element that has allowed us to survive is being able to navigate through various market conditions, uh, bear markets, bull markets, flat markets. Uh, but more importantly, I think, is having a client base that is truly aligned with that investment approach. Having a client base for us that is aligned with a long-term investment approach um, and having clients who understand that uh, often the best time to invest capital is when your stomach says the other, something different. You know, we need clients who think like we do. We need clients who think about investing, or contributing capital when markets are down. And we have that aligned client base and that's really been highly beneficial to us over time. How do you think uh, how, or how do you get relations with people who are interested to act against their stomach feeling? Well, that's not easy. I mean, it's not easy for the investment manager as well, because we're all human. We all have a certain emotional response to different environments. I think that knowing, knowing the kinds of clients and their outlook up front is really, really important. It's critical. In other words, as Charlie Munger said, you should choose your clients as you would your friends. And it's very true. In order to survive over a long period of time, you really need that alignment. And it's, it's, it's an interview really between, it goes both ways. It's not just clients interviewing side capital, but it's me interviewing clients and making sure that there's that alignment and educating them Uh, making sure we're all on the same page. Uh, we have a letter on our website that is written uh, not to attract clients, but it's actually written to dissuade clients from investing. And the reason why we do it that way is uh, in order to make sure there's transparency up front and there's a total alignment. How long does it usually take uh, till clients are aligned with you and How much back and forth is this? Well, typically, if there doesn't seem to be an alignment almost immediately, then there's never going to be an alignment. Uh, so we, we tend to know that fairly soon. Now, sometimes you, know, you need to sit down with, with, with the prospective investor and try to understand what his or her ultimate goals are. And we want to make sure that we can fulfill those expectations as, as well. But it's usually fairly evident to us uh, from a very early stage of that so-called back and forth interview. In other words, if a client or prospective client asks, you know, how much money or what kind of return you think you can make over the next year, uh, that that's automatically a red flag because we don't think that way. There's, I'm sure, many, many firms that think that way, but it's just not our approach. We're thinking in terms of five years plus. You mentioned the word ultimate goal. What is the ultimate goal of you as an investor? The ultimate goal is to continue to learn, continue to adapt to changing environments. You asked me earlier how we've survived. Uh, so we're t we, talk, we talked about um, an aligned client base and being able to add value to clients. But being able to add value to clients is also a function of being able to adapt to changing times. So one of, my, one of my goals is really to be a, being able to, to adapt to changing times because the investment landscape changes constantly. 
So how maybe walk us through this adaption. So you started out 23 yeah. years ago and like maybe your portfolio is a good signaling for this. How was it then and how has it changed over time? Yeah, no, that's a great way of looking at it, uh, focusing, in on, focusing in on the portfolio. So in the early days, the, there was a, such a fascination with the so-called new economy companies, the internet companies of the time, and many of them uh, were just worthless businesses. They had, they had poor business models, they had no viability to turning a profit. Uh, but the market was really obsessed with them, uh, especially around uh, going into the NASDAQ peak in March of 2000. Consequently, uh, so-called old economy businesses at the time, the um, industrial manufacturers, auto insurance companies, anything that didn't have that kind of tech element, those businesses were really hated. So if you look at our portfolio in those days, you can see that the portfolio was really full of these acid heavy, old economy types of businesses that were trading at very low price to earning multiples just because they were overlooked by the street. And the focus at that time, as I mentioned, was on technology companies, uh, particularly anything with a dot com in the name. So as time has gone on, we've realized that uh, you don't necessarily have to be in those types of businesses that everybody was obsessed with at that time. But we do like the idea of asset light, highly scalable companies that are run by truly talented management teams, businesses that have a ability to reinvest capital at high rates of return over a very, very long duration. So our portfolio over time has moved increasingly toward asset light businesses, scalable businesses, with large total addressable markets and with deep competitive moats. So how does Tesla fit into this framework? <laughs> because it's far from being asset light and it's one of your largest positions. So that's a really interesting question. So they're investing uh, billions of dollars of capital per year. However, what's misunderstood by the street is that their returns on incremental capital are really, really high. Um, so in uh, last year, we figure the returns on incremental capital were around 80 percent. Um, I don't know of another uh, 700 plus billion dollar company that has returns on invested capital of about 80 percent. The returns on equity returns on total capital are also in the mid 30s. Um, so this is a business that has uh, a lot of the characteristics that we look for across the portfolio. So we're talking about large total addressable markets. They're, they're not only in, um, in auto, but increasingly in electricity and power generation, power storage. They have multiple verticals in which they're moving into, which have massive addressable markets. So you have, a large, you have large markets, trillion dollar markets. You have high returns on capital and equity. You have high returns on incremental capital. You have a culture of innovation. Uh, you have a management team that is extremely skilled in allocating capital, and you have deep, uh, deep economic moats in across those verticals. So, if you step back and you look at Tesla and you actually and you dive into how the business is performing, how the business has developed, um, it fits all of those characteristics that we look for in 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 the other twenty companies in the portfolio today. How do you come to this eighty percent? So we look at the uh, capital that they contribute in terms of property, plant, and equipment. We look at their inventory. Uh, we back out any uh, items on the balance sheet that, that are not part of that calculation, uh, any, any cash and uh, cash receivables. Um, and we look at their, their net profits after tax, and we calculate uh, that kind of return. So it's it's a truly incredible um, incredible business, and I think that those those returns on incremental capital are now showing through more obvious numbers. So you can easily calculate return on equity, return on capital, but returns on incremental capital you have to do a little bit uh, more work. But ultimately, the two start to come together, and that's why you're seeing returns on equity and returns on total capital moving up 
And I think more and more investors are starting to realize that this is a business, while capital intensive in many ways, is actually capital light in other ways. And as the company moves increasingly towards, towards software with 60 to 70 percent gross margins, you're going to see um, higher returns on capital or at least um, higher returns on incremental capital. And you're going to be able to, to kind of figure out you know, the direction of the company. And I think that will start to show through on a lot of the other metrics as well. It's time for a quick Edward Tillman. Here we go. Are you looking for a beautiful and efficient way to analyze stocks? Then please check out what my friends at Stratosphere are building. They've built a great tool to visualize data, to get ideas about ownership of stocks, and many more information that's helpful in your analysis process. You can find that tool via the link below, and feel free to sign up. It's free. Thank you for your attention. And now, Edward Tillman, and uh, you mentioned the talented management that's important for you. And with Tesla, we know one of the key manager, Elon Musk. Yeah. But he's now also busy with Twitter and other projects he got into. Um, maybe what are the other players at Tesla outside of Musk that have impressed you? I mean, tes Tesla has uh, 200,000 or so employees. So this is a deep management team. Uh, if, if Elon were to disappear tomorrow, uh, this is not a company that disappears. The foundation has been laid at this point for continued success. If you look at, there, there, are, two, there are two wonderful biographies on, on uh, Elon Musk and Tesla that have come out over the past several years. Uh, one actually came out a number of years ago by Ashley Vance. And what Ashley Vance so nicely talks about in the book is how Elon has always been involved with so many projects. I and mean, this is not something new to him. He's been involved with numerous companies at, at, at the same time from the very beginning. Uh, so he is, he is skilled at um, allocating his time. He is skilled at managing multiple businesses. And I wouldn't be surprised that in the coming years that you see him step back from the CEO role, CEE, CEO role at Tesla. And who are the, the figures in the back that lead? Because 200,000 people are like, that's the wide definition of management. Yeah, you have shared alignment of uh, members of the production and people you can align with stock options, but like there are a few who, who make the key decisions. Well, I mean, there, there are many. And I think I don't want to speculate as to who actually winds up taking over. I do think it will come from somebody within Tesla. But I think there are many opportunities. Um, you know, the, the, it, it remains to be seen as to who he'll appoint. And he's, he, he can be erratic in that regard, as we know. But I think it'll, it'll be somebody from within Tesla. I think their management team is, is quite deep. Maybe let's jump from the framework of having many activities back to your business building journey. We already touched upon a bit. Um, what side outside of the pure investing focus has helped to build you your business? Focus is really super important. And I think different people are able to focus in different ways, right? They're the people, for example, I mean, Everybody's life is different. So there are people who like to get up early in the morning and they start their day right Another away. Like <laughs> so that, that, that would be me. Um, there are the night owls, right? I guess you're a night owl, yes. right? So you work best in the evening. Um, I find that being able to go to sleep early and wake up early uh, resonates with me and I'm the most productive that way. How do I go to sleep early? Well, uh, with all this you know, media and, 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 and activity that happens during the day. Meditation at the end of the day helps. So I practice um, a form of meditation called Transcendental Meditation, which I'm sure many of your viewers are well aware of. It's been very helpful to me. You're supposed to do it twice a day for 20 minutes. Uh, I don't always make twice a day, um, but when I do make twice a day, I can, I can feel the difference. So TM, or Transcendental Meditation, has helped me to focus a lot. Um, just regular exercise has helped me to focus a lot. Um, 
So it's that that just works for me. Um, so sleep, exercise, and meditation. And it really hasn't varied. Uh, you know, I started my business uh, many, many years ago, more than two decades ago. I started out in, in my apartment on the Upper East Side of Manhattan. And I would literally get up around 6.30 in the morning, I would make breakfast, and I would go to work on my dining room table. And I would take a lunch break at 12, uh, and then I would go back to work, and then I would end the day at five, and I would exercise. And that kind of routine hasn't really changed over those many, many years. I'm just very uh, regimented in that, in that regard, but that has helped me also to not get distracted along the way. Now you've talked a bit about the I uh, or the you and the way of building your business and your focus and keeping this, which is important because I've talked to other investors that also tell me that I have to focus and be able to keep up with the struggle investing means. But let's switch to the we because uh, also in our pre-talk you mentioned network, network, network is important to build a business like you did. Maybe you can elaborate a bit on this and also what helped you to network in spaces where you might have a competitive advantage to other investors? Sure. Uh, we all have to use the cards we're, we're given. Uh, some people are given more cards than others. Uh, one of the cards that I was given is being able to live in New York City. New York City is uh, an amazing uh, um, city in which to live in terms of its networking opportunities. There are just so many groups and organizations that you can become a part of and so many other investors and prospective clients, uh, people, friends, they all come through New York City in, in one, one time or another. The problem is that uh, it's also very distracting so it's super important that when you're living in a, a huge city like Manhattan that you're able to, to maintain that focus. Um, it's one of the reasons why uh, Charlie and, and, uh, and Warren preferred you know, building their business out of, out of Omaha. The networks that have been most beneficial to me have come from um, the field of arts, uh, fine arts in particular. Um, I've loved art from a very early age. Uh, both my parents were art collectors. Uh, I've spent a lot of time with artists over the years. I've spent time, so many, like countless hours in museums and through that exposure to museums, getting to know trustees of museums, getting to know uh, other collectors. Uh, so that's been an area that's been um, a, a, a wonderful uh, circle in which to build relationships that has that has worked for me. But there, there are so many different areas when you live in a city like New York or London or, or Berlin, where we are. What I learned from living in Berlin, that you have to learn to say no to a lot of things, <laughs> to stay focused. Warren and Charlie yeah. made it easy. Sure. Or Warren made it easy. He just focused on being in Omaha, where, he can, where it's easier to say no to a lot of things. How have you learned or how has it helped you to say no to a lot of things? Well, well, first off, uh, I think it was Charlie uh, Munger who said the difference between a successful person and a really successful person is that the really successful person says no to almost everything. I did not say no to almost everything in the earlier days of my investing journey. I do say no a lot more often today, simply because if I don't, I will not have the time uh, to dedicate to my clients. So it's very important that the number one priority is the clients. That, and, that, and that means uh, research, being able to spend time looking at businesses. But the line is sometimes gray in other words, spending time with other investors, networking with other investors, fellow investors who are like-minded or who might be interested in similar areas or even different areas, can be hugely beneficial um, to being helpful to your underlying investors. It's because you learn from them. 
You know, they help you uncover potential blind spots. Are there any people that inspired you? So, so many. In this sense? So many. Um, I learned, uh, you know, my late father, Jerry Sai, worked for Edward Johnson Sr. at Fidelity Investments. And they had a conversation once. I was told Edward Johnson Sr. said to my father, once you buy a company, uh, don't talk to management again because you'll never uh, be told anything other than what management wants to tell you. Right? That's, that was their philosophy in the very early days from what I understand. They've since changed. Um, but I don't think that's the right approach for me. And I've learned from people, friends like Ron, Ron Barron, um, who, who, who has just instilled in me this idea of uh, understanding culture, understanding that a business is not a, um, an entity that exists on its own. It's made of people. So people, understanding the people, understanding culture, understanding what makes a business tick, what makes management tick, I think is super important. So we try to align our client capital with businesses that are innovative, uh, with businesses that are run by skill, skilled allocators, and with companies that are always trying to push themselves further and trying to understand what the competition is doing and, 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 and doing a bit more than that. Do you look for an investing community? Then Good Investing Plus might be the place for you. Here you can make friends with other investors, get feedback on your ideas and learn and grow. If you're interested in Good Investing Plus, please click on the link below. I'm looking forward to your application. You mentioned competition. What is your framework for competition for your business? Who are you competing with as a fund? I'm competing primarily with myself. That's how I feel that, that this is a journey that uh, it's an ongoing journey. And I'm just trying to get better at what I'm doing um, each day. I'm trying to learn something new each day. I'm trying to implement some sort of um, um, process or idea uh, that uh, that uh, you know something new each day that is beneficial to the the side capital ecosystem. Uh, it's uh, I operate with this. There's this Japanese concept called kaizen, which roughly translates to that continuous improvement over time leads to to large change. So everything that we do is based on this idea of. Kaizen. So I think about competition first and for, foremost with myself, but of course also I'm competing against um, my benchmark, which has been the S&P 500, and I'm competing against uh, other investors. If other investors can add more value to underlying clients, then um, those underlying clients should be with those investors. Uh, so there's this constant, and that's what I, what I love about the investing business. It's, it's, it's hugely competitive, uh, and it always it, it has constantly pushed me to try to be a better investor, a, a better person, um, more thoughtful person. It's just it's just a constant like yin and yang. It's a constant struggle, and I like that. Chris, thank you for your insights. Um, I want to make a cut at this point because like not only competition brings you forward, also role models. We have two role models embedded in this picture, uh, but in the next video we're showing soon, we will talk about other role models that play the role for you in forming you as an investor. Thank you for coming for this first episode. And if you're interested in learning more about Chris, we recently had him in our community Good Investing Plus for an in-depth interview with a lot of cool questions. It's not only me asking questions there and uh, you can find the link to apply for Good Investing Plus below. Feel free to apply and thank you very much for your attention. Looking forward to seeing you again in the second video.